Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, philosopher, historian, and Thomas Jefferson scholar. I'd like to invite you to the second in a series of lectures on Thomas Jefferson. The series is titled The Sentimental Traveler Lectures, and the series is uh, introduced to show you a different side of Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson the philosopher. The title of this lecture is why Jefferson often neglected to capitalize the word God. There is overwhelming confusion apropos of Thomas Jefferson's religiosity. Uh, most scholars point in the direction of Thomas Jefferson's Tartuffery. On the one hand, for example, he attended worship. He did so often. At worship, he participated in prayers, sang hymns at various churches of various denominations. On the other hand, he uh, consistently railed against the empleomania, uh, the, the uh, political ambition of religious clerics, and he railed against uh, sectarian religion. Again, he wrote of God privileging in humans, oftentimes in letters. He says, for example, when the, uh, when the measure of slaves' tears uh, when the measure of slaves' tears shall be full, a God of justice will awaken to their distress by his exterminating thunder. This was in a, a letter to de Meunier in 1786. On the other hand, he commonplaced Lord Bolingbroke early in his uh, life. Uh, in one passage, he talks of uh, Bolingbroke. He writes of Bolingbroke uh, talking about the cosmos. It's, it's not a privileged place for humans. Thirdly, he had amicable relationships with many local ministers, even Calvinists. Now, what's strange about that is that he consistently spoke out against Calvinism, uh, especially its Trinitarianism. So why is there such confusion? The, the, the simple answer is the confusion is a result of Thomas Jefferson himself. Uh, when we appeal to his writings, we find that uh, we find a, a multiplicity of things in his writings, uh, often contradictory messages. Is the scenario hopeless? As many writers say it is, uh, indeed it's not. Jefferson wrote, employed the terms God and deity in many of his writings. Now uh, he says, I pray to God and God bless you quite often in his uh, correspondence. Um, and oftentimes he refused or failed to capitalize the word God, which might suggest to some a greater reverence. And, and I want to show that that's not the case. Now, who or what was Thomas Jefferson's God? Well, when we appeal to his writings, we find he says precious little about deity. And uh, he often in letters says, I refuse, even to intimates like Adams, I refuse to speak of my religiosity to anyone. Uh, for example, in a letter to Adams in 1817, he says, say nothing of my religion. It is known to my God and myself alone. So where are we now? I argue that Jefferson wrote enough on deity, especially in his correspondence, to enable us to, to, to piece together uh, with a great deal of accuracy, his notion of deity. Where do we look? We look at his letters to intimates. We look at his literary commonplace book, where he pass, uh, where he commonplaces passages to Bolingbroke, and we look at especially his version of the Bible, the one that exists uh, that was written in 1820. We look at his literary commonplace books, uh, where he his commonplace book, where he uh, commonplaces Lord Bolingbroke from Bolingbroke's philosophical works. Now, <clears throat> Bolingbroke speaks of God as sovereignly good, almighty, and all wise. God, Bolingbroke's God, has no problem about making certain forms of matter think. Bolingbroke's God does not intervene in foreordained cosmic events um, through things like Christ's miracles, through punishment for the fall of man, or for in any sort of divine superintendency in the cosmos. Bolingbroke's God establishes once and for all cosmic harmony. He writes, nothing can be less reconcilable to the notion of an all-perfect being than the imagination that he undoes by his power in particular cases. What is wisdom once thought sufficient to be established for all cases? Okay, thus uh, in Bolingbroke we find deism, not theism. Uh, theism implying a God that, that uh, intervenes in human affairs. 
allows for things like the miracles of Christ. Bolingbroke's deity has not made man the final cause of the whole creation. Man is a part of creation and not a privileged part. Bolingbroke's deity does not communicate its or his existence through revelation or divine inspiration. Bolingbroke's deity does not punish or reward humans in an eternal afterlife. He writes, for justice requires that punishments and rewards ought to be measured out in various degrees and manners according to the various circumstances of particular cases and in due proportion to them. So justice, uh, Bolingbroke thinks, that uh, ought to be meted out in this life. Um, the religious law of Bolingbroke's God is the law of nature. He says the law of nature is the law of God. In other words, God's law is to be found in a uh, study of nature. He also says natural religion represents an all-perfect being to our adoration and to our uh, love. It requires humans to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Now, one of the findings um, in my research is that, and this is seldom recognized by scholars, is that Jefferson appropriated Bolingbroke's concept of God. And not only that, he kept intact that concept all of his life. He appropriated Bolingbroke's concept of God, and he, uh, he did not change his mind on that concept of God. We can appeal especially to two letters to John Adams, one in 1820, one in 1823. I take the latter first. He says to Jefferson, he says to, to Adams, when we take a view of the universe in its parts, general or particular, it's impossible for the human mind not to perceive and feel a conviction of design, consummate skill, and indefinite power in every atom of its composition. Now notice Jefferson's use of the words see and feel. He doesn't say we, we uh, reason through analogy. Uh, there's, no, there's no appeal to any form of analogical argument here. We literally see or feel, and the appropriation of see or feel comes, uh, he's appropriating from Desta, the Tracy, and Lord Kames. And um, Jefferson means, following these other two, that man just sees God in the cosmos. Man can feel, feeling, uh, implies a connection to the heart, uh, to, to human beings' moral sense. In his 1820 letter to Adams, he writes, uh, uh, he writes paradigmatically in the manner of uh, René Descartes, I feel, therefore I exist. On the basis of sensation of matter and motion, we may erect the fabric of all the certainties we can have or need. Notice there is no appeal to reason. It's not, I think, therefore I exist, I feel, therefore I exist. So feeling an appeal to the moral sense uh, pre presumed to be lodged in the heart is, is where Jefferson goes in. Now, Jefferson also uh, uh, limbs the attributes of deity in both letters to Adams. He says God is a designer and a, quote, fabricator of all things from matter and motion. He is, he says again, their preserver and regulator while permitted to exist in their present forms, that is the, the, the matter, the forms of matter, and their regenerator into new and other forms. He says that God is superintending, it is a superintending power that maintains the universe in its course and order. So we have the notions of superintendency, we have the notion of regeneration uh, are attributed to deity. Uh, and, and this we get from his appeal to the astronomy of his days. He says, stars well known have disappeared, new ones have come into view. Uh, he's appealing to the supernovae explosions that uh, have occurred prior to him, uh, Tycho Brahe and others uh, in the 16th century, and to discoveries in biology. Certain races of animal, he says, are become extinct. Um, this is something Jefferson did not believe early in his life. He, he thought that all species were fixed and that there's no su uh, such thing as extinction. But by the time of his uh, letters to Adams, he has, has bought into extinction of animals. So there needs to be a, a, a superintendent deity and a deity that regenerates. Now, in his 1820 letter to Adams, he speaks of all things as matter. He says, the human soul, angels, God. All these things are matter. For if they're not, he says, they are nothings. So even God is a, a material being of some sort. 
Where does that leave us? Is, is the universe God? Is the, the, the matter in the universe just God? And Jefferson is silent on that matter, so we have no uh, business speculating on that. But when he talks of materialism here, he cites uh, Locke, Desta de Tracy, and Stewart as authorities for his materialism. Was Jefferson a deist or a theist? Um, one can make arguments for both. Deism implying that, that God sets up uh, the universe, as, as, uh, as Bolingbroke said, uh, in, in its entirety at first, and uh, the universe plays itself out, or the events in the universe play themselves out, and there's no need for intervention. In a letter to Benjamin Rush, Jefferson says, when great evils happen, I'm in the habit of looking out for what good may arise from them as consolations to us, for providence has, in fact, so established the order of things that most evils are means of producing some good. The sense, the sentiment here is one of a pre-established harmony, not intervention. Now, in his 1823 letter to Adams, as we've already seen, he talks of a god, uh, of deity, as a regenerator and superintendent. This suggests rather strongly periodic intervention, and uh, if so, then theism. Now, the question I pose at this juncture, it's a reasonable question, did Jefferson begin as a deist and uh, uh, be become a theist, someone who believed in, in an intervening God in the course of nature, because of, uh, because of species extinction, because of exploding stars and things that, uh, that uh, he knew about in, in nature? Was he forced to, to move from deism towards theism? I suggest that we need not go that route, and I don't think Jefferson ever went that route. Why? Well, let's look at his 1820 Bible. I, I think that explains a lot. That was constructed right around the time of his letters to Adams, and it has some bearing on solving the issue. Now, in the Bible, it's well known. Uh, Jefferson, what Jefferson did in the Bibles is he created his own New Testament, looking at the four Gospels of the Evangelists, and he cut out all things, he says, against the course of nature. So he wanted to create a, a life of Jesus, and an account of Jesus' wisdom, uh, Jesus' moral thinking, um, by removing what he thought was impossible or improbable, what, is, what was ridiculous. So the first thing he does, he removes uh, thematological events, uh, uh, miracles and the likes, right? Anything uh, uh, against the course of nature, he tells William Short. He cites as examples calf speaking, statues sweating blood as illustrations. Now, now of course, such things, Jefferson things, are unreasonable and ridiculous. So take them out of the, they, they don't belong in any account uh, of the Bible or any account of, uh, any such events should not belong to a, an account of the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, consequently, when we see in Matthew 15, 32FF, where Jefferson uh, speaks to and feeds a large crowd with two fish and uh, five loaves of bread, Jefferson excises that. And Matthew 9, 18FF, when Jesus brings to life a dead woman, Jefferson excises that. This is against uh, nature. These are things that are impossible. Uh, Jefferson still was following Bolingbroke here. Remember Bolingbroke who said, well, you know, we must reject the notion of a, of a deity uh, who undoes by his power in particular cases what is wisdom, what thought sufficient to be established for all, for all case, uh, allowed for. Um, now, if deity could not establish a harmony at the beginning of the universe that somehow could play itself out without intervention, Bolingbroke thought that this was a sign of uh, divine omnipotency, not divine uh, omnipotency. So it, it seems a reasonable argument, and Jefferson, I think, bought into that, that argument. Um, so how do we explain Jefferson's deity, being matter, and uh, um, not intervening in the course of nature, if indeed that's Jefferson's view, and I think it is. Uh, we, we can understand Jefferson's deity be a stoic-like deity, a god that um, that is equivalent to the cosmos, uh, the material cosmos. Or we could understand um, superintendency in God being a regenerator in the sense of a, a, a builder placing a thermostat in a house. In doing so, the thermostat regulates uh, at, at the building of the house the, the temperature of the house 
and uh, all such things are taken care of, like the temperature of the house thereafter is taken care of without any sort of need for the builder to intervene. So I think something like that, one of these two views is the correct view. Theism is unneeded. So let's go back to, so why does Jefferson somewhat irreverently, you know, fail to capitalize God? Uh, the reason is, is that it's the same sort of reason David Hume gives when he talks of God. Um, it's not that for lack of respect for God. God, for Jefferson's God, is a God that needs to be loved, a uh, quay creator. The cosmos is an unbelievable act of creation. It's an unfathomable act of creation. And by virtue of deity being the creator of the cosmos, or at least equivalent to the cosmos, humans, uh, by virtue of their rationality, by virtue of, of understanding through moral sentiment uh, of the seeing deity, immediately in the cosmos. Oh God, great gratitude. Uh, the problem is, is that God probably is not even aware that, 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 uh, that humans are, are praying, singing to God, and, and even, uh, you know, giving great gratitude to God. Um, Jefferson's God and his, co Jefferson's cosmos is so large, and Jefferson's God is, is uh, so, if I want to put it, somewhat indifferent to the things created, because the things that are created are so many, and the cosmos is so large, that this deity would be incapable of hearing the supplications of human beings. Uh, the cosmos uh, and its creatures are beautifully constructed. We're all essential parts of the cosmos. But nonetheless, we're relatively inconsequential. So, in the God who created us would be no wise... Um, no wise concern whether or not Jefferson or anybody would spell his its name with a lowercase g, um, incapable of, of, of knowing of what humans are doing or con being concerned with what humans are doing. Nonetheless, Jefferson did in some measure conceive of the cosmos as a miracle. Um, he says we have a moral duty, it's a, it's a moral duty for sensual, rational creatures to pay homage to their creator because of human awareness of the enormousness, the beauty, the perfection of the cosmos. How can we pay uh, homage to God? I think Jefferson would say through science, through, through studying the cosmic skeleton by reading things like Newton's Principia Mathematica, uh, work in which he, he gets at the secrets of the physical cosmos by examining telescopic or microscopic phenomena, seeing the macro and the micro, uh, even participating, as Jefferson often did, in scientific farming, learning how to grow things better and more efficiently. We can pay homage and show our love for God through art, through replicating great figures like uh, the, the bust of Houdin's uh, bust of George, not bust, the statue of George Washington, uh, paintings of great figures, paintings of nature, and, and, and beautiful works of art, works of architecture as well, and even wonderful gardens as a way of, of, of sort of celebrating God. Um, so, why then, one may ask, did Jefferson periodically attend religious services, even sing and pray, if his God was deaf to supplication, deaf to praise? Why did he befriend certain religious clerics of various denominations if uh, he didn't think much of, uh, of uh, religion in, in particular cases? Uh, when he thought, uh, as he was often fond of saying, is that what all religions have in common is what, of true, is what is true of religion, namely, love God and love your neighbor with your whole heart. Um, one could say if we appeal to his notes on the state of Virginia, query 17, Jefferson talks of uh, religious debate, and he says, God created humans in, what, what in such a way, so they, they relate, they, they greatly debate political matters, and we greatly debate human, uh, political and religious matters, um, often through, and here we often misuse our reason. Humans are allowed by their deity to form different, incompatible, and consistent notions of God. They, they have 
radically different political opinions, and they debate these out openly. So it's, it follows that deity must have deemed in homogeneity vis-a-vis uh, -vis religious and political concerns to be a good, at least in the short term, we could say, of human development. Jefferson, I think, was a progressivist. He believed, uh, like Kant, that, that humans were progressing over the generations, over the centuries. So if deity deemed in homogeneity of a human opinion on such matters to be a good thing, humans are certainly in no question to... Uh, in no position to question deity. Um, as Jefferson often said in such, or sometimes said in such cases, ignorance is the softest pillow. So we may say Jefferson's about hypocrisy, his tartuffery is explicated by a conception of deity, by his unique conception of deity, which is essentially bold and broken, and by his love of God, his love of cosmos, and his love of his fellow human beings. And I think there can be no question uh, Jefferson was indeed capable of great love. But he also said, no matter what goes on, because his belief in, in, in progressive uh, uh, living, that, that human beings were progressing over time, and presumably the cosmos itself is moving in a progressive direction, that reason would have its say. He says, reason and free inquiry are the only effectual error, uh, agents against error. They are the natural enemies of error and of error only. So even if God constructed humans such that inhomogeneity uh, held the day, at least at some point in time, God enabled humans to have reason, and they also had a, a, a moral sentiment, moral sense in some sense, where they can know right and wrong, uh, they can sense right or wrong directly. But reason would be able to, uh, over time, to be able to hammer out what is correct and what is correct, uh, incorrect in religious and political matters, and then we are... Thankful, I think he would say, for God for that. Now, I, at the end of my uh, lecture here, I want to direct you to my webpage. That's www.thomasjeffersonphilosopher.com. That's one word, thomasjeffersonphilosopher.com. And there you'll find a large number of short essays uh, on Thomas Jefferson as a philosopher, this one included. And there you'll also find a uh, uh, a means of ordering my newest book, Thomas Jefferson Uncovering His Unique Philosophy and Vision, uh, in which I talk about Thomas Jefferson's cosmos, his notion of deity. I talk about uh, Jefferson's political philosophy. I talk about his moral sense, ethics, and I talk about his philosophy of education. You'll also there be able to learn more about me and uh, much more, I hope, about Thomas Jefferson, the philosopher. I want to thank you.